panelists, we are now live on Facebook and on Zoom. You can switch your panelists. panelists. We are now live on Facebook and on Zoom. Apologies for the feedback. Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody at home. Um, welcome, Mitchell, Walter, Jamima, Peter, Eve. Uh, we are now live on both Zoom and we are also live on Facebook. This event is called Understanding Canadian Peacekeeping. And I want to wish everyone a good evening. Um, a great welcome to our panelists, as well as to all of you who are joining us from home. Uh, our panelists tonight are Jamima Pierre, Eve Engler, Walter Dorn, Mitchell Thompson, and Peter Langeal. Welcome, Jamima. Welcome, uh, Eve, Walter, Peter, Mitchell. It's, it's so great to have you here. My name is Bianca Majeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, who are the host and organizers of today's event. Um, you can find out more about the work that we do at foreignpolicy.ca. And the Institute is based in Montreal or Jojage on the traditional territory of the Ganiangehaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We also recognize the continued presence of the Métis, Innu and Inuit people on this land. Um, and it's great to see this turnout today. Thank you to all of you folks who are here on such a sunny, sunny summer day. Um, so the chat is open um, and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so please do let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, and as always, keep your comments to each other and to the panelists, civil, cordial, and free from racist, sexist, xenophobic, or otherwise harmful commentary. Um, so like I said, we are streaming live to Facebook. I'll pop the link into the chat so that you can share that with the other folks at home too, um, who, uh, who didn't make it to the Zoom. So for today's event, yesterday was National Peacekeepers Day uh, and Prime Minister Trudeau's statement noted uh, their courage, perseverance and compassion have helped strengthen the rule of law, uh, protect civilians, uphold human rights and advance peace and stability in many countries. Uh, their tireless work in the service of peace represents true Canadian values and leadership. So my question is, is this accurate or is the story more complex? Uh, understanding Canadian peacekeeping is, is very important to Canadian foreign policy. And today we're asking whether Canadian peacekeeping has been an alternative to NATO or a means to advance Washington's objectives. Has it been a benign alternative to war or has it advanced the very forces that we say we are defending uh, against, protecting against? Should progressives push to demilitarize or move uh, towards UN peacekeeping? Um, we also have a poll that I'm going to launch uh, right now, actually, for folks in the audience um, asking these questions. Um, we're really curious what you think. Uh, and I'll relaunch it at the end and we'll compare to see if there's any shift um, after we hear from speakers. So uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. And because we have uh, divergent perspectives on the panel, we're going to make it a hybrid debate format. Um, each panelist is, uh, is going to have uh, eight minutes, uh, up to eight minutes to start. And then um, after that, another two minutes if they want to add to their initial remarks, rebut, or reflect on another panelist's comments. And then we're going to follow this up with a Q&A period. Um, and we'll try to take a few questions from folks at home as well. So please do drop those in the Q&A box. Um, so since the, uh, the idea for this event was actually inspired by a Mitchell series for the Maple um, titled The Bloody History of Canadian uh, Peacekeeping, provocative title, it's appropriate to begin with Mitchell. Um, and so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, uh, Mitchell Thompson. Mitchell Thompson is a writer with Press Progress and a contributor to Jacobin. He's also worked as a journalist for Vice, CBC Radio, Post Media, and other outlets. Welcome, Mitchell. Yes, thank you very much. And, and thank you to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for, for hosting this event. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. In, uh, in 2016, um, shortly after Prime Minister Trudeau pledged to make Canada a compassionate uh, voice again by reinvesting in peacekeeping, uh, there was a speech by a former Department of National Defense Committee member remarked that actually the history of peacekeeping uh, was primarily aimed at waging war to serve the interests of NATO, and, and that the distinction made by, by many academics, by many politicians between uh, ugly, destructive American war and Canadian peacekeeping, in fact, he argued, 
reflected, quote, the endless enlarging of small differences. Now, there's no question that the speaker in question, uh, there's no doubt that the speaker in question has an axe to grind, but I, I think he also has a point. And he's certainly not the only official involved in the Canadian military apparatus to, to make this point. Um, and so what we endeavored with the article was to go through the, the history of peacekeeping and the history of how people involved have actually described <laughs> what they do uh, as, as peacekeepers and what Canadian soldiers do as peacekeepers. Um, the marketing for classical peacekeeping, typically based on Chapter 6 of the United Nations Charter, uh, brands it as being impartial, uh, based on the consent uh, of the host parties, and, and based on the minimal use of force. Um, although throughout the history, uh, there's equally just as many cases of officials, diplomats, and the like, acknowledging that the distinction between this and, and war is quite fuzzy. To begin with the point on impartiality. Canada's 1964 uh, white paper on defense uh, in the era of Pearson traced the origins of peacekeeping operations not to some grand vision or, or benevolence, but actually to the collapse of, of pre-war empires. And it is important to note that nearly every peacekeeping mission, with, with the exception of a few, ha have been in the former colonies of, of major Western powers that Canada is closely linked to. Um, indeed, the first peacekeeping operation in, in Egypt uh, came after it was attacked by Israel, Britain, and France. Um, three countries Canada is, is closely linked to, and uh, two of which are, are NATO powers. Um, uh, Canada is one of the few NATO powers allowed in this operation, although actually um, the Egyptian government immediately noted uh, Canada's close ties to Britain and had an issue with, with its role, in particular the fact that one of its military regiment was known as the Queen's Own Rifles. Um, there's actually an interesting note from a former Canadian diplomat, John Holmes, he writes that leading up to this inter operation in, in Egypt, uh, diplomats struggled, quote, to persuade the British that the UN force could carry out more effectively the missions of pacification and protection than they had taken upon themselves in Egypt uh, after the government nationalized the, the Suez Canal. Um, this is further complicated by Pearson's own views on colonialism. In 1957, he defended, quote, those nations who have direct responsibility for non-self-governing territories from sanction within the United Nations. In a 1951 speech, Canadian foreign policy in a two-power world, Pearson said, we are faced now with a situation similar in some respects to that which confronted our forefathers in early colonial days, when they plowed the land with a rifle slung over their shoulder. If they stuck to the plow and left the rifle at home, they would have been easy victims for any savages lurking in the woods, unquote. The impartiality of Canadian peacekeeping is, is further complicated by Canada's role in NATO. Indeed, the Soviet Union raised the issue with this ahead of the operation in the Congo um, uh, as a member of NATO, an alliance which is dead set on, in Pearson's own words, a war against communism. Uh, it became a bit of a problem when the war was between right-wing belligerents, uh, Belgian paratroopers, and a left-wing uh, embattled president, indeed the first uh, elected in Congo's history. Um, indeed, the 1964 white paper on defense, uh, to go back to that, wrote that peacekeeping could be expected to grow, quote, correspondingly with Cold War containment measures. Um, and, and indeed, we see NATO power politics undoubtedly guided Canada's intervention as, as Cyprus. Um, there's a quote by Sean Maloney about that, in the interest of time, uh, I will spare everyone. On the point of consent, uh, this is also uh, complicated um, by the fact that uh, you know, after uh, peacekeepers enter, it is actually quite difficult for a lot of these former colonies to get them to leave. Uh, Pearson remarked in an interview with McLean's uh, after Nasser had suggested his dislike for, for the Canadian peacekeepers, we feel that Egypt had the right to be consulted and to agree to the entry of an international force, but having given that consent as she did, she has no right to control the force to order it about or to tell the force when it shall leave. In 1967, when the peacekeepers were ordered to leave by an Egyptian general, they initially refused until they got orders from the Security Council and the Secretary General. And indeed, uh, when uh, the peacekeepers returned uh, after the, the war, the, the Arab-Israeli war, um, the Security Council in particular took steps to ensure, quote, it would decide the question of termination and that there was, quote, no desire for repetition of the, 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 for, the first forces withdrawal at the unilateral request of Egypt. 
Um, this became more problematic in the, the 1990s when the, sec the Secretary General at the time in 1992 gave a, a very famous speech called the Agenda for Peace, where he argued that the consent of the host and the, and the minimal use of force, previous principles of peacekeeping had to be seriously qualified. The time of absolute and exclusive sovereignty, he declared in 1992, had passed, even while acknowledging its theory was never matched by its reality. In Somalia and other operations thereafter, UN forces in intervened increasingly more aggressively without consulting anybody in the country, and often led far bloodier interventions as a result. I'll come back to that. There was also the drive at this time for a rapid reaction force, which, which perhaps other people can speak on the panel. Um, Canada proposed this specifically to take advantage, not of, uh, you know, uh, peace and love, but of a decline in possible Security Council vetoes and establish it as they described it, quote, the sharp end of future UN action. And even where they did consult the host party, this became problematic as well. From 2000 to 2008, when the UN forces, including the Canadians, were stationed on the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea, 2005, the Eritrean government demanded the Canadians leave. Um, the Undersecretary General said, we are not planning to pull out any of the people who have been mentioned, and, and said it would be referred to the Security Council, uh, which had also condemned the expulsion order. So this problem has persisted throughout the, the entire history of, of peacekeeping. Um, on the use of force, I, I, there's two kind of qualifications I would make to the claim um, that uh, it's rested on the, the minimal use of force. One is that in many cases, uh, the peacekeepers have worked with invading armies, and particularly other NATO powers. Um, the case of the Congo is, I, I think, the most disgusting example. Um, when, uh, as the embattled president, Belgian paratroopers entered in, into their former colonies. And um, the head of the UN peacekeeping force, um, the chief of staff to the UN mission, uh, famously told the Belgians where the left wing president was uh, when he slipped into hiding. Uh, the Belgian paratroopers captured him, they killed him, they dissolved his corpse in acid, and they stole his teeth. Um, thereafter, uh, Fred Graffin, the historian who wrote for Canadian Defense Quarterly, writes um, that uh, Mobutu, the future right-wing dictator backed by the United States, learned to trust the Canadian officers who long had a dislike for the previous left-wing president. Um, and indeed, Mobutu was brought to Canada on an official visit, on an official visit in 1964, and the Canadian colonel who uh, ratted Lumumba out uh, was decorated and remarked in an interview in 1990 that I never regretted it. Vietnam is another case where uh, Pearson in 1965 said he supported wholeheartedly the uh, American war. Um, and the Canadian soldiers on the, the control commission repeatedly acted as what was described as a listening post for the American war campaign and the American bomb campaign and, and indeed the CIA. Um, and, and we know that the, the Vietnam War did not involve the minimal use of force by any means. Um, brings us to Yugoslavia. Um, in a more recent case, it's remembered that in the lead up in 1994, the Secretary General of the UN actually asked NATO to prepare the plan for its first bombing campaigns. I'll, I'll wrap up very soon. Um, but indeed, Rick Hillier, in his memoir, A Soldier First, also recalls that he had conference calls with uh, General Rupert Smith, British UN, uh, the British UN commander in Sarajevo, the US Navy Admiral Leighton Smith, who was a NATO commander in Naples, to, in his own words, plan and coordinate the airstrikes that, that began uh, later that year. Around the minimal use of force, strictly in cases of self-defense, this also has never really been borne out by reality. In 1973, the Secretary General uh, said that peacekeepers' right to use self-defense would mean allowing it to use force against resistance, um, anyone who tried to stop uh, peacekeepers from trying to use, carry out their mandate. In Cyprus, after the forces were attacked, they were sent 50 caliber bullets and rocket and anti-tank weapons, primed for heavy shelling. Um, and, and since uh, the emergence of Chapter 7 peacekeeping, a parliamentary report from 2019 noted that peacekeepers have been increasingly empowered to use force, not only in self-defense, but to protect civilians and encounter threats. Um, and this has led to some increasingly violent uh, operations that do blur the line between war. I'm not going to talk about the events in Somalia. I think the scandal is well known, but I, I would uh, encourage people to read the 1997 report that came afterwards, which attribute at least a part of the violence to the gray area between peacekeeping and, they, as they described it, low-intensity war. And indeed, many officers and many of those who were court-martialed 
said they themselves were shady on the difference and thought it was, in, one, in the words of one, a straight combat operation. In Haiti, which someone else will be discussing later, we know that land force operations in their counterinsurgency manual describes both the operation in Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, and the peacekeeping mission in Haiti simultaneously as, as counterinsurgency operations. Um, and by no means has the operation in Haiti involved the minimal use of force either, as, as we'll discuss later. So I'll end it there and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Um, you can read uh, Mitchell's critical series on Canadian peacekeeping in the Maple uh, magazine, um, which is at readthemaple.com. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from you soon. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Professor Walter Dorn. Walter Dorn is a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces uh, College. He also served as a consultant with the UN's Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Welcome, Walter. Thank you very much, Bianca. And I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss peacekeeping with uh, this distinguished panel and with the audience. Um, and I'm a lover of peacekeeping history, so I like to have a good long hour long discussion with uh, Matt Mitchell about the uh, stories from the Cold War and, and afterwards, and I'm, I'd be quite happy to provide some comment on some of those episodes. Um, I would like to focus most of my effort on cases and places where I've been missions I've served on. Um, and uh, to start off with, I, I like to safely assume that all of us are against imperialism aggression and domination of one group over another. And we really have to make the world a fair, more just place where one nation can't just conquer another nation and where uh, groups within nations can't dominate over each other. And I think we're all in favor of human rights, peace, prosperity, freedom of individuals and nations, um, and especially the smaller and struggling nations of the world who need our help, desperately need the help, and we should be able to provide it, including providing for security. Now, Canadian peacekeepers have been supporting this cause um, imperfectly, no doubt, but the objective is to bring about greater peace to allow for prosperity and freedom. And uh, if I look around at, at uh, the, the history, I've been following peacekeeping since the mid 1980s. I can think of so many places where I was uh, grateful for peacekeepers whether it be monitoring the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan where Canadians played a major role or giving uh, Namibia its freedom uh, in the 1990 referendum or Mozambique after the uh, really savage wars at the front line against South Africa or more recently in West Africa and Sierra Leone, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire, all places where there have been massacres of huge scale and peacekeepers played an imperfect but still important role and bringing about peace. And visiting the missions today, uh, which, which I have done in recent years, the current missions like in Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo or Mali, I can see the uh, important role that peacekeepers are having to deal with a whole variety of groups, including some Rwanda-backed groups that were trying to cause havoc in Eastern Congo and uh, sacked sack the, the um, people of the Eastern Congo, of their precious wealth in mineral wealth, and that the uh, UN actually took on some of these very vicious groups like the M23 um, and CNDP before it. Going to the Middle East, so Matthew made a big point of that first uh, emergency force, which I think is really a good example, and, and I love to be able to debate the fine points of it, but UNEF is very important because it was the UN emergency force as the first peacekeeping force in the world. And it was proposed by a Canadian at the time, Secretary of State for External Affairs, Lester B. Pearson. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize the following year for having made the proposal and having brought some peace to what otherwise would have been a continuing war uh, of aggression against Egypt. And it was Egypt that accepted it on its territory. Now, it's true that in 1967, Nasser was bent on being the warmonger. And he's the one who wanted to attack preemptively and so um, it was very natural for, and I've spoken to the force commander uh, at the time, Indian General Inderjit Rikki, who was very resistant to bring out the forces because he knew that we just allowing for the war. And later on, um, Nasser regretted what he had done. Obviously he lost the six day war and, um, and it would have been very much to his benefit had the peacekeepers stayed. Um, if I look at Eastern Europe, uh, Bosnia, 
and uh, the, the role that the peacekeepers played there between the, the in, insidious forces between, between the different ethnic groups and how they managed to sew together a country, which is, which is now at peace, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I mean, there's obviously going to be lasting tensions that have existed for a thousand years, but at the same time, the accomplishments in that period of peacekeeping, whether it be the European Union or it be the um, UN or even NATO forces who were acting in a rather impartial role, unusual for NATO, um, they played an important role in bringing about the peace in, in Bosnia. And in neighboring Macedonia, it was the UN's first preventive deployment force, which came not from that Agenda for Peace speech, but for the Agenda for Peace report that Budros Budros Ghali released in 1992 proposed that you could actually put in a, a preventive force to stop a conflict from occurring at the beginning. It was very successfully used in Macedonia where, where war did not break out. Now I can look in Central America, where when I first got involved with, with international affairs and peacekeeping, there were civil wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, and through peacekeeping forces, they managed to solve through the Escopoulos II agreements, some very important uh, conflicts. So I think that peacekeepers played a major role and I have friends and colleagues who, who went digging for, for weapons to be able to find the hidden arms caches that the different groups did in these countries. I, I, I think I'd like to um, put the main case being on the one that I participated in. In uh, 1999, there was a call for um, people from around the world to help the UN run a referendum in an Indonesian occupied East Timor. It had been occupied by Indonesia for 24 years and before that 450 years of colonialism. And in contributing that mission, I did the most meaningful thing that I've done in my entire life, which is help to see the birth of a new nation. And uh, certainly I bear the scars. I was called a spy by the Indonesian militia. I was uh, threatened as were my members of my team. Indeed, one, one person in my team was killed in the Swai massacre and I regret that uh, we didn't have stronger peacekeepers there to prevent the Swai massacre of September 6, 1999. And I, I wish I could have been there myself to help save his life and risk my own, uh, even, um, even at, 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 the, at risk. And the UN unfortunately did back, back out in the face of this very brutal force from the Indonesia, but they came back two weeks later and it wasn't another Rwanda for which the UN uh, you know, stayed in only three, number 300, which stayed about six or seven in East Timor. But when it came back, it, it actually did a transitional administration and helped the country get on its feet before parliamentary elections and president's elections and the, the dawning of a, of a new nation, East Timor. And I was very uh, proud to, to be part of that and that Canada could contribute to it. In fact, when Canadian forces deployed, to uh, the UN mission and to Interfet, they deployed to Zumalai, an area where, uh, where I had done voter education. And I saw that it was international pressure that prevented Indonesia from claiming that territory as its 27th province. Now, principles are principles just like justice, and um, they're not always maintained and they're difficult to do in, in the difficult dilemmas of life. But by and large, the UN has tried to stay impartial. And it, and it does go in with consent. It was Patrice Lumumba and um, Kasavubu, the president of the Congo, who called uh, in July 1964 to UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld to send in a force. So it's very important for, for recognizing that this, these are consent for the initial deployment. And in some cases, it's the peacekeepers' responsibilities to prevent warmongers and those spoilers of the peace process who would like to kick the UN out and prevent any action by the international community on their malign designs. And in fact, the, the um, third principle is not actually a minimal use of force. It's non-use of force except in self-defense or defense of the mandate. So unarmed peacekeepers have gone to these territories by the thousands without arms. They put themselves into war zones without any weapons. And sometimes I ask my students who have been UN peacekeepers as UN military observers, would you prefer to have arms or not? And some of them actually do say, we feel safer without the arms because we're not a threat to anyone. Now the UN is really under-resourced and under-equipped. And I'm disappointed that Canada doesn't contribute more. We currently contribute only 30 police and about 30 military personnel of peacekeeping. And we can do a lot better during the Cold War um, in places like Cyprus and, and in, um, uh, in, in the uh, Middle East, we, can, we contributed about a thousand peacekeepers. So now Canada has gone 
far down 3% of what it, what it traditionally contributed. And that's a big disappointment for me. And I'm hoping that um, despite all its flaws, that, uh, that Canadian peacekeeping can once again see the light where the Canadian soldiers and police officers and civilians and people like myself who volunteered, I volunteered through CUSO, uh, Canadian University Services Overseas, that we can find a way to help our fellow world citizens and make a difference in favor of planet Earth and of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, thank you. For, for folks who would like to find out more about Walter's work, you can go to walterdorn.net. Um, also, a uh, note um, to all registrants that you will get a replay of this event, which will be posted to YouTube and to Facebook as well. So don't worry if you've missed anything. Also, I don't know if folks have noticed, but um, most of you did actually fill out the poll, which is awesome. And I just shared the poll results with you um, from the beginning of the panel. Um, and I will poll you all again towards the end to see if there's any uh, shifts in your uh, perception and ideas uh, around Canadian peacekeeping. So uh, our next panelist of the evening is Professor Jamima Pierre. Uh, Jamima is the Haiti Americas Coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace and Associate Professor in the Departments of African American Studies and Anthropology at UCLA. Welcome, Jamima. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much to the Canadian Policy Institute, Foreign Policy Institute, for inviting me and um, 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 allowing me the opportunity to be with you all. Okay, so um, in early October 2010, there were reports that people in rural Haiti were dying from what appeared to be cholera. It was unusual since cholera had not been in Haiti for over a century. I contacted a friend who lived in Port-au-Prince and asked him if the rumors of cholera were true. Yes, he replied immediately. It's from some of the minister troops and the UN knows it. They've already shipped out the soldiers responsible. MINISTA is the French acronym for the United Nations Stabilizing Mission in Haiti. The official peacekeeping mission that began on June 1, 2004, three months after a Western back coup d'etat. Early speculation in the West, of course, about um, cholera's origins deployed well-worn, stereotypical and racist tropes of Haiti's poverty and unsanitary conditions. However, affected local communities had already pinpointed the source. The UN Maye base located a few meters from a stream flowing into the Artibonit River, the main water source for the surrounding villages. Local communities complained of large septic trucks regularly dumping fecal matter into the river. And an AP reporter based in Haiti went to the UN base where at the back of the base he saw, um, which was barely separated from the river, he saw broken PC PVC pipes that leaked black liquid into the river. How does one not read this desecration of Haitian villagers land and water as also blatant disregard, disregard for them as human beings? and as an extension of war and occupation. Can we even imagine a UN outfit conducting itself in this way in a European village, in a white US or Canadian neighborhood? It took three years to bring cholera under nominal control in Haiti. And in that time, it is estimated that between 10,000 and 30,000 people had died from the terrible symptoms of the disease and almost a million sickened. For six years, the UN denied responsibility for bringing cholera to Haiti but reversed course in 2016, admitting its culpability and issuing an apology, but no restitution was offered. For Haitian people, the cholera epidemic is an extension of a totality of violence, material, political, ecological, enacted by the so-called UN peacekeeping mission. But I want to argue that this should not be only about demanding accountability and restitution from the UN for its attack on Haitian life and society. It is better to ask some more important questions why is the UN in Haiti? Why do the killing of tens of thousands of human beings by a foreign occupation force gar not garner global attention, much less, much less empathy? The answers demand that we connect the UN's use as proxy for the US's illegal military occupation of Haiti to the social and political havoc that the UN has wreaked on the country. In fact, the establishment of MINISTA in 2004 was itself dubious. Minister took over from the US military occupation that began in immediately, immediately after the US, Canada, France backed coup d'etat. 
the coup was set in motion for some of you who must know, who must know this, this coup was set in motion in 2003 when representatives from the US, France and Canada met in Ottawa to figure out what to do about Haiti and Haiti's popularly elected president. No Haitian was invited to this meeting, which was called the Ottawa Initiative. This illegal coup d'etat was both enforced and cleaned up with the sanction of the UN Security Council, which took up the task of military occupation when it took over from US forces under the guise of established peace and security. Now here I want to point to the critical role of the UN Security Council in this mission. On the same day of the coup d'etat, at the behest of the permanent members of, of US and France, the UN Security Council passed a resolution that authorized the immediate deployment of a chapter seven multinational interim force, presumably to help secure and stabilize the country. Chapter seven is really when a country is at war. Haiti was not at war, but it also allowed a, an armed force to go into the country. Importantly, it would be used, this force, as a counter um, insurgency mission against those who protested the coup in the presence of foreign troops. But just three days earlier, when CARICOM, which is the Community of Caribbean Communities, appealed to the Security Council for help of an international peacekeeping force to protect the Haitian presidency and Haitian sovereignty, US, France, a permanent member of the Security Council, flatly rejected the call. Now, a multi-billion dollar operation minister has had at any given time in Haiti between 6,000 and 12,000 military troops um, and police stations throughout Haiti alongside thousands of civilian personnel. And the UN occupation under Minister was marked by its brutality towards Haitian people. In addition to cholera, the UN forces were used to quell real pro-democracy rallies of those who protested the coup. One such case is when hundreds of heavily, heavily armed UN forces invaded one of the poorest neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince and pumped 22,000 bullets over a couple of hours in a tiny space, killing scores. Peacekeepers also hated in Haiti for sexual exploitation, rape of young girls as young as 11, as well as boys and homicides. And as recently as last year, the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti sued the UN for child support for the numerous children the soldiers fathered and abandoned to their young mothers. While it is claimed that this occupation officially ended in 2017, with the dissolution of minister, the UN has remained in Haiti through a new acronym, acronym BINU. And BINU continues to have an outsized role in Haiti's inter internal political affairs. But what has also emerged with the UN's occupation through peacekeeping, through this peacekeeping scheme, is also what's unique to Haiti, the core group, made up of representatives from Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Spain, the US, the European Union, the Organization of American States and the United Nations Organization, the core group plays an active and interventionist role in everyday political affairs in Haiti. What buttresses the power of the core group is its identity as an entity for the quote unquote international community with a mandate sanctioned and continually renewed by the United Nations. What is also um, astonishing is the fact that this contemporary imperialism in Haiti and the United Nations peacekeeping apparatus as a brutal enforcer of this imperialism is the unwillingness to acknowledge its existence, even by contemporary scholars who travel and um, study and travel to Haiti regularly. How does a full military and political occupation remain under the radar and receive so little attention, political otherwise, and intellectual engagement? Now, I want to offer two explanations as I end, and these will serve as provocations. In the first instance, we need to understand the contemporary guises and articulations of US and Western imperialism. In the case of Haiti, Western imperialism is funded by the United States and the United Nations, but organized through a multinational coalition that has included Canada, Brazil, France, Chile, the European Union, and the OAS. Secondly, we cannot underestimate the relationship of race and white supremacy, and particularly anti-Blackness and empire to empire. For Haiti, foreign occupations have always been premised on the idea that not only was Haiti always on the verge of falling into chaos and anarchy, but with the deepest, deeply racist notion that Haitians are unable to govern themselves. Thus, for Haiti, occupation no longer needs U.S. Um, Marines as in the past. 
a multinational force, or an international cohort of technocratic experts in security and democracy are just as willing to further the aims of Western imperialism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamima. You can find out more about Jamima's work. Um, uh, please do follow her and also find out more about the work that she's doing with the Black Alliance for Peace. And I will post the link to that in the chat, the Black Alliance for Peace. Thank you so much, Jamima. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Peter Langille. Peter Langille specializes in peace and conflict studies, United Nations peace operations, conflict resolution and mediation, and independent analysis of defense and security policy. Welcome, Peter. Peter, you're gonna need to, yeah. Right. Many thanks. And uh, thank you especially to you for hosting this event, Bianca. Uh, let me give you a brief heads up on where I'm coming from. Uh, in peace research, we're very big on alternatives to war and violence, especially viable policy options to affect shifts, conversions, transformations of what we view as a very dysfunctional war-prone national security system. And we do view the UN as central to an emerging global peace system with UN peace operations, improved peace operations as crucial to the transformation. Now, I'd also argue that the UN and peace operations demonstrate the potential of cooperation and solidarity to shift us away from our prevailing culture of violence toward a global culture of peace. And I'm thankful to the UN for having run a decade devoted to advancing a culture of violence, advancing a culture of peace and nonviolence. Uh, I think I'm also thankful that youth share increasingly a one world perspective, that we're gradually moving into a global neighborhood. Yet we, we really know we're in trouble that we're mutually vulnerable now on two fronts. We all confront an urgent crisis in climate breakdown, especially with the ever higher costs and risks of constant preparation for more war, which might kill us any day now. And as to the costs, they're unsustainable. It's already $2 trillion annually in military spending. But far worse, it's now over 15 trillion annually in the damage caused by war and violence. So I think it's undeniable that we have a war system, one that's unsustainable, as it wastes enormous resources. People and governments really need to address climate change, poverty reduction, sustainable development. But our war system, it's not gonna fade on its own. It's in place to secure an array of very powerful vested interests. It'll have to be shifted gradually toward a peace system that can secure legitimate needs of people on the planet, our common security needs. Now, I think we all know that NATO isn't at all inclined to help on that, to help with a global peace system or with common security. NATO's a Western military alliance, right? 30 allies run by the Pentagon, US State Department, with a record of inflating threats to justify higher military spending and to develop more advanced weapon systems. I think it's fair to say that NATO really embodies militarism and is now effectively the multilateral extension of the military industrial complex. By contrast, the UN is our one universal organization. It has 193 member states, including a charter commitment to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. It was really developed during the last world war, primarily to cur curtail anarchy, stop aggression and war, to advance disarmament and development collective security, conflict resolution, decolonization, human rights. 
it continues to make progress. For one, peacekeeping, it's widely credited with having saved millions of lives and billions of dollars. And even though there are four to five outright failures that we saw in the mid early and mid 90s, peacekeeping in, out of 71 operations, four to five failures, that's, that's over a 95% success rate, something that no military in the world could claim. So it's worked surprisingly well. And it's not too hard to dig in and find dirt and smear an organization that's worked to keep the peace. It's had to deploy actually hundreds of thousands of people, including militaries around the world into war zones. So it's easy to blame the UN or UN peacekeeping for something ugly that's sensational and newsy. Where is that going to lead us? I don't, think, I don't think it's going to take us anywhere better. Yes, the UN has been manipulated and exploited by great powers, especially the P5 members of the Security Council, Britain, France, China, Russia, the United States. Can't expect those countries to be saintly. Nobody should expect the UN system to be perfect. It is what it is, the sum of its parts. 193 diverse countries that are often conflicting and competing. Dag Hammarskjöld, the former Secretary General, was right when he said, the UN won't take us to heaven, but it might save us from hell. And now we're rather close to the latter. You know, we already are on, in an era of overlapping emergencies, okay? We know that the future, if there is to be one, is going to depend on far deeper cooperation. I think we also know that global challenges are going to demand global solutions. And those aren't going to come unless we have deeper multilateral cooperation in the UN. I, of course, I'd agree that the UN has to be more effective, that UN peace operations have to be substantively improved. But there are going to be a, a lot more, there's going to be a higher incidence of iron conflict, unfortunately, ahead. Now, I'd really like to think of the UN as being better prepared to provide care and help to people in emergencies, rather than say, oh, we have these problems with peacekeeping. We can't do this. Well, don't progressives and peace activists actually want a more effective UN, one that can prevent armed conflict and protect people? A UN that can encourage military build down and disarmament? so that those huge resources currently wasted on war might actually be devoted to poverty reduction, to climate change addressing, to sustainable development. Th those are peace research objectives that I actually share. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I look forward to hearing more from you uh, in the next round of comments. Um, you can find out more about Peter's work at sustainablecommonsecurity.org. The next speaker uh, of the evening is Eve Engler. Um, he's our final speaker. He's a Montreal-based writer and political activist. He's published 12 books, including most recently, Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military. Welcome, Eve. Thank you. Um... So I think the first thing we have to think about when we talk about Canada and peacekeeping is Canada's position in the world. My reading of Canadian foreign policy is that it's been, it's been overwhelmingly driven by two things, support for empire, historically British, today American, and Canadian corporate interests. That's overwhelmingly what drives Canadian foreign policy. More specifically with the military, the Canadian military is incredibly integrated to the military of the biggest empire, arguably the greatest purveyor of violence in the history of humanity, which is the US military. There are you know, hundreds of agreements of different sorts between the Canadian American military. There's exchanges, there's just an endless stream of, of alliances. The American military trusts the Canadian military more than any other. It allows the Canadian military to have access to their operations more than any other. 
so that's the first way to first piece to start understanding Canada and peacekeeping. And I don't believe that there's any example of Canada dispatching large numbers of soldiers in UN missions that was opposed by the US, right? As um, <coughs> David Birkinson put it, uh, who's a right-wing uh, military uh, historian he's, in 2016, he said that Canadian peacekeeping has been, quote, done to serve the interests of NATO and not because we are placing our military at the service of humankind, right? It's, this is not a benevolent exercise. There are small examples around the edges of a certain amount of Canadian troops being dispatched in missions that certainly had positive effects, uh, but the overarching policy is one of uh, alignment with NATO and specifically the American uh, uh, empire. The U.S. prefers to have its dirty work done through the U.N., of course. It has a higher degree of legitimacy. If they can't do it through the U.N., then they'll do it through NATO. If they can't get it done through NATO, <laughs> then they'll have a coalition of willing or they'll go alone, right? That's the, the, um, the reality of, 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 uh, of international affairs. And... Um, you know, if you take a look at Suez, 56, Cyprus, the objective was to, was to basically deal with a disagreement within NATO. You know, at Suez, it was a Israeli, French, British uh, invasion of Egypt that the Americans opposed. And, in, and they basically wanted a way out uh, they wanted to, to get the uh, former powers out because the U.S. wanted to dominate. They wanted to tell the former colonial European colonial powers there's a new boss in town that was them. And they wanted to, to uh, um, uh, push out the, the uh, they were also fearful of, of rising Arab nationalism. And basically John Foster Dulles went to Lester Pearson and had a plan for the U.N. peacekeeping force to, to help uh, the Americans out and to in part help the British get out of a, a disastrous uh, a situation they were in vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Washington. So the objective was to deal with divisions within NATO. As uh, Jemima has, has very uh, forcefully and overwhelmingly, in my opinion, argued, uh, the UN mission in Haiti is a, has been a horrible imperial crime. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian government was pushing to continue the UN mission in Haiti. And that's just a you know, f continuation of this usurpation of, of Haitian sovereignty, of Haitian democracy, et cetera. Also, as Mitchell pointed out, the significant Canadian mission in the Congo was a significant imperial crime. And it is correct that Lumumba called for a UN mission uh, because the Belgians basically their decolonization was designed to destabilize uh, any sort of genuine decolonization and they immediately backed a secessionist movement. So it is correct that it was the legitimate prime minister that that called for the UN mission, but it's also correct and, and the case is absolutely overwhelming. You can take a look at the internal Canadian government files. It's not, this isn't up for, up for debate that the Canadian government worked to undermine Lumumba, that the head of the Canadian, uh, Colonel uh, Jean Bortium, boasted about his role in Lumumba's assassination, that Canadian officials pushed to have the Canadian uh, a signals detachment oversee UN intelligence, as it was put, quote, to maintain both Canadian and Western influence, right? Um, so this was a you know, clear imperial crime and the UN worked aggressively to subvert Lumumba. That, that's, not, that's, not up for, that's not really up for debate in any, any serious uh, forum. The Escott Reed, prominent Canadian diplomat, then, then ambassador in Germany, he said after uh, Lumumba's assassination, he said, quote, already the United Nations has demonstrated in the Congo that it can in Africa act as the executive agent of the free world, right? The assassination of a, 
elected independence leader. That's the free world that we're talking about that Canada's peacekeeping mission was enforcing in the Congo. You go back with the Korean mission. Right. I mean, the Korea command that continues, we, you know, we, we, there was a war that left to three or 4 million people dead, 27,000 Canadian troops under this US UN command, uh, which, you know, continues. Canada is actually sending naval vessels uh, based in Okinawa now in Japan in, involved in, in provocative maneuvers uh, uh, with vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese patrol aircraft. Um, ostensibly under the cover of being under a UN command 70 years later. So it's about power relations, right? What the Americans got with Korea, they couldn't get in 1960 even with the Congo mission, some more decolonization had taken place some changed dynamics within the UN Security Council structure. So those power relations within the UN change and they ebb and flow. Uh, and that, that changes what can be um, uh, uh, achieved via the UN, but as the, as uh, Jimima pointed put out with the um, with the uh, mission in Haiti, what they what they were able to get with the Security Council uh, in the uh, late at night and ten o'clock p.m. in three minutes to get a okaying a UN mission, uh, the you know French uh, American Canadian uh, interim force uh, getting that okayed in three minutes of discussion speaks to the power relations within. The United Nations, and let's just say Haiti doesn't have too much power within within that uh, uh, institution. So yes, there's you know there's some ambiguity to certain UN missions that Canada's been part of, but the, but you have to remember the overarching question is is Canada has not been dispatching large numbers of troops in missions that are undercutting uh, the U.S. empire a and. The other part now, I think, to go more broadly in discussing UN peacekeeping and, and, um, and how it's used is that for many years, the military saw UN peacekeeping as a way to justify its budget, right? A mythology had developed in this country, which continues to a certain extent, where basically we have this idea is Canada is a peacekeeping nation and, you know, we, Lester Pearson, Nobel Peace Prize, etc. And so the military saw in promoting its involvement in peacekeeping as a way to justify its budget. Even if most of what it did was, you know, 90% of what it did was around NATO, the peacekeeping thing was a way to justify its budget. So I think that's really important to understanding how peacekeeping has been used. And, and, and you know, Rick Hillier, if, you know, famous, his famous quote of, you know, where the, we kill scumbags is Afghanistan quote, I think from 2005, you know, part rep represents partly the break from that sort of idea of Canada, the military selling itself as this peacekeeping force and, and uh, using it to justify its budget. Um, but for decades, that was really important in terms of the public relations of the Canadian uh, uh, military. And sort of associated with all of that is, is, you know, this is where we get into this question of, so what should we do? And, I, and, and Peter was po pointing out, well, our alternatives are NATO or the UN, right? I, I don't believe that. I think there are other alternatives, right? I think we can talk about Getting out of NATO, I think we can talk about defunding the Canadian military. We can talk about demilitarization. That's what we, you know, to some extent we get, we get into. But you see that with with um, with the with the how UN missions again like around Afghanistan. The opposition to Afghanistan was put forward as you know Jack Layton, the head of the former head of the NDP, would put forward opposition to Afghanistan is we're, we're not engaged in Sudan. Or, or, or Walter, you know, he, he talked about it at, at the time um, when he said, uh, you know, about Afghanistan, Canada's military mission in Afghanistan, he said, quote, the first consequence of our current deployment in Afghanistan is that Canada is currently at a historic low in its UN peacekeeping contribution. So we're not opposed to Canada's, you know, 40,000 Canadian troops in Afghanistan because it was wrong, because it was, you know, a violation of, of uh, uh, it didn't have UN approval, uh, uh, that, that it was, you know, an occupation force, but we're opposed because it's taking away from, from something else, right? And that, and that gets to this whole, like, idea of, you know, where Canada is in the world, right? What is, what is, um, what is Canada's foreign policy? What is the Canadian military's foreign policy? I, I'm of the opinion, we have to be honest with ourselves, the world needs less Canada, right? We, we don't need not Canada in Afghanistan, but we need Canada in Sudan. We don't need not Canada in, in bombing Libya, but Canada in Haiti. 
we need less Canada. And we have to be honest about it. it it's it's a, a completely outside of bounds in the dominant foreign policy discussion, but that's actually the reality, right? Because Canada is at and has been before even the rise of the American empire has been at the heart of empire, has had a particularly close relationship to the main imperial powers that have caused the most violence and death and destruction around the world now for, for throughout Canada's history. That's, that's the reality. Um, so, you know, progressives, I believe, need to, need to not, not have some blanket that, you know, there's no situation in which the, the UN has ever done anything good, or not have any blanket that there's no situation that any Canadian uh, a peacekeeper has, you know, done some, some good thing. But that's not where our emphasis should be. Our emphasis should be on demilitarization, Canada getting out of NATO, defunding the Canadian military, and quite frankly, opposing and, and ending Canadian imperialism. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Uh, so that concludes our first round of comments. Um, you can find out more about Eve's work at eveangler.com and I've been posting the links in the chat. Thanks to all of you who filled out the poll, um, uh, the first poll. I'll be putting a second poll in after we hear from our panelists a uh, second time. Um, yeah, most of you voted, um, and I will be revealing the results uh, shortly. Um, all right, so we're moving on now, and I just want to remind panelists um, that you only have two minutes for this round. Uh, I'm going to have to cut you off if you go any longer than that, because we have limited time. Um, and we are going to start with Mitchell. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you to all my, my colleagues. Uh, I really appreciate all the contributions. I, I just want to clarify one of the intentions of the article. Um, I do really believe that war and occupation is horrible. Uh, it is something we would all like to see end. Uh, in particular, uh, the violence in East Timor uh, was hideous, aided as it was by the block of NATO imperialism as was the violence across Latin America, the death squads, the terror strings, and the like against elected left-wing governments and, and popular movements. I am very happy to see that violence that's over, but it is important to note that Western imperialism is the hegemon globally, and it is responsible for the overwhelming majority of violence and oppression in the world. And it has never seen the UN or peacekeeping as a threat to its endeavors. Indeed, in 1950, the American National Security Council tethered our vigorous sponsorship of United Nations. Uh, it is, of course, the principal reason for our long continuing endeavors to create and now develop the inter American system as much as containment to help its overall goal to check and roll back the growth of communism, to partner with Saudi Arabia, and to stop the emergence of, as they described it, Latin nationalistic regimes across Latin America. My endeavor is not that I would prefer war. Or that um, you know, uh, I, I believe that you know that there's some conspiracy pertaining to the UN. But it is important to know that this is not a neutral body, um, and neither is the Canadian military, you know, which often operates where the same officers interchange between peacekeeping and war making operations um, with increasing, increasingly slipper, slippery mandates and, and distinctions as military officials themselves have outlined. It is important to know that Pearson himself, when he initially proposed the peacekeeping force, didn't propose it necessarily as an, a clear alternative as a war, but as something between combat and between merely passing resolutions. Now you can call that what you want. It isn't on the face of it peace. And it, we are talking about degrees of the use of military force here. We're not, in most of the cases I've outlined, um, I, and indeed that was noted by retired diplomat uh, Patricia Fortier. Mitchell, um, that's two minutes. I'm going to have to move yeah. on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Walter. Yes, thank you. Uh, Eve, I'm very glad that you do acknowledge there are positive effects of peacekeeping operations. We can debate about the motives of countries like Canada. Um, Jemima, on Haiti, I agree that the cholera ep epidemic is truly tragic. And it was probably brought by uh, Nepali soldiers on the UN mission. 
but I don't try to stigmatize them for spreading the disease. I really want to see help given to Haiti to help recover from the disease, which it did, uh, as you mentioned, after three years. And what you failed to mention is the hospitals, all the care that was given by the UN, the rescue during the, the earthquake, including the tragic one of 2010, where I lost several colleagues and 100 UN workers died. You also look at the um, action against the brutal gangs in Cité Soleil uh, as in, in a completely different fashion than I do. There were people there, and I've walked through the streets of Cité Soleil shortly afterwards, who were, were celebrating that the UN could actually take away those bandits who had restricted their lives. So I, I would say that um, the UN has played a constructive role in Haiti, even if it's an imperfect one. And the last thing I'd like to do is deal with the sexual exploitation and abuse and say that the UN is taking major steps to deal with this. Let me just share my screen and show you how the UN uh, has a website that um, counts who, who is uh, the alleged perpetrators, where they come from, here are the countries from Cam Cameroon, South Africa, Gambia, all the way down there. Canada has three alleged perpetrators from 2015 on. There are, there are three police officers. And um, this is a way of accountability transparency. You can see who, where the investigations are, who the, uh, the victims are, but realize that this is just a few cases of the hundreds of thousands who have served in peacekeeping. So um, it's, it's really unfair to blemish the, the, uh, the entire uh, enterprise by the actions of just a few. Okay, I'd, can I answer? I'd like, first of all, as a Haitian person, I'm completely offended by this in the sense that the killing of 10,000 to 30,000 people by dumping feces in people's water is not, was not good. It's not good. It's like you kill, you kill 10 to 30,000 people. You maim and shoot others. And the other thing is, I, I also have to say, the Haitian people did not want a UN occupation. In fact, the UN occupation was brought to Haiti against our wishes. And the counterinsurgency is because people were protesting it. The UN was used as a proxy to uphold a coup d'etat that Canada, France, and the US um, uh, 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 allowed to you know, uh, fund it to happen in Haiti. So that's that's the first thing I, I want to respond to that. The thing, you know, there's a tendency for Westerners to create problems in these countries and then come in as saviors. And this is exactly what's happening right now, right? There, there, there's this, there's the conceit, there's the inter, there's the conceit of 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 the West, right? Continued imperial conceit of the West, where there's you know there are structures uh, in the context of European racialized and. And, and racist imperial expansion and colonization that create certain organizations like the WTO, the UN, um, the World Bank, the IMF, all those are Western institutions that were structured to maintain Western dominance at the end of, at the, at, during decolonization. And so let's go back also and think about the UN. Is the UN really a democratic institution? The UN has five permanent members of the Security Council. At the center of the, which are the at the center of the Security Council, Britain, France, Russia, China, and the U.S. It also had ten temporary members who change out on a rotating basis, but only the permanent members get to vote. The Security Council holds all the power in the United Nations. It's a body that authorizes everything. The General Assembly, the 190 or so countries, can make recommendations, but they have no power. Most Western-led organizations work in support of U.S. imperialism. I have to say, this idea of the international community, the rules-based international order, all these terms, all these organizations, is based on some key assumptions that the U that Western-led institutions are created through benevolence and concern from human rights and dignity, as opposed to perpetuating imperialism. Which is which? Which is so, so? Then, when you have these peacekeeping, so-called peacekeeping operations in countries where Black and Brown people live, formerly colonized countries, we don't see this as a liberatory uh, 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 thing. We see it as a continuation of Western imperialism, and we see it in, by the way that they treat the people. I mean, you know, the people in the Congo are protesting the UN occupation. They've been protesting for the past few weeks. So, how do we see that? Because until we see, until we uh, recognize that, we have to understand that the whole world 
is based, is structurally, we live in an unequal world. There's a whole complex of unequal historical material relationships and processes and related ideological and discursive projects that structure together engagement between the West and the rest. There's an unequal world. The West determines what happens, what goes on, and they determine who the saviors are, who the who 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 the gangs are, and so on and so forth. We're not asking you why is the West allowing the guns to come into Haiti. So I, you know, I can go on, but I'm really offended by this because I'm sitting as a Haitian person and watching someone tell me the UN has been great. And, and I'm completely, completely upset by that. Thank you, Jamima. Uh, uh, and, and Walter, we're now going to move on to uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd be pretty quick to agree that the UN was really pushed into Haiti and Minusta by the Bush administration, as well as Canada and France. And the most within the UN probably do regret Minusta, the operation. Uh, it, it, but I, I'm also leery about taking one specific operation and generalizing from it that all UN peace operations are driven by imperialism in Washington. And I'd like to return to the uh, question as to Washington's control. In fact, the United States hardly contributes any personnel at all to UN peacekeeping. Uh, China's increasingly influential in both contributing personnel and funding. Russia provides the strategic airlift. It transports people and supplies into most UN peace operations. France uh, coordinates most of the UN peacekeeping operation. Southern states, uh, provide most of the people, the personnel, the troops for UN peace operations. The Chinese, Indians, Russians, Africans, and Global South are not involved in peacekeeping to maintain American hegemony or to promote imperialism. They view the UN as worthwhile, as a global counterweight to wars. And, you know, former Canadian governments were actually very keen on both the UN and NATO serving as a multilateral counterweight to offset pressure from Washington, especially for ways to avoid being drawn into destabilizing military plans. And Canada's not alone in that respect. M many countries participate in the UN and in UN peacekeeping to avoid being alone, to avoid being isolated and less secure to avoid being exploited by great powers or aggressive neighbors. So for many, there's safety in numbers and the UN provides that. Washington's very powerful, it's richest country has the most largest military, but it does not control or direct most of UN peace operations. Thank you. And maybe if there's time for a quote, I'm gonna give you a quote from Ralph Bunch. You have about 10 seconds. Okay, I'll leave off with that. Uh, Ralph was a drafter of the UN Charter uh, Nobel, the first African American who won the Nobel Peace Prize and uh, a leading peacekeeper. In his words, the UN exists not merely to preserve the peace, but also to make change, even radical change, possible without violent upheaval. The UN has no vested interest in the status quo. It seeks a more secure world, a better world, a world of progress for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next, we'll hear from Eve Eve Engler. Yeah, I, I want to I want to get talk a little bit about Haiti first of all. So I, I actually met with one of the uh, the big gangsters in Cite Soleil uh, back in two thousand six, and his explanation of what was going on was political. You can debate that one way or another. I can say what when the UN killed uh, at least twenty three uh, civilians on July six two thousand five in Cite Soleil. Um, and they, it was ostensibly to kill, kill Dred Wilmay. The community put a mural up with, with uh, Dred Wilmay next to a photo of Aristide and a photo of uh, Che Guevara uh, after his death. So I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I can't say, I can speak with 100% confidence that this was just some political person. I mean, I think, you know, it's, this is a terribly impoverished slum. I'm sure there's lots of uh, 
you know, social dynamics that are not, not ideal, uh, but the community clearly viewed this from a political lens. So we have to understand that. And also with the UN, you know, what, after the UN caused the cholera outbreak, they continued, they continued to dump feces and waterways that they knew people were drinking from. They cared so little about Haitian life that they continued to do that and they were caught doing it. Okay, like that you can't, you know, this, it, it comes out of a coup d'etat to overthrow a government and then it just continues this like litany of abuses that you just can't say that like, you, you know, that this, this is a serious imperial crime with Canada right at the center of. But at a bigger picture level, the question I have is why? Why would a progressive focus on, 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 on peacekeeping? Why, why would we focus like, if it's ambiguous, if we say there's some examples of Canada doing imperial endeavors in Korea via the UN and Haiti via the UN and the Congo via the UN, you know, complicated in Somalia and Yugoslavia, but why would we focus on more UN? Why wouldn't we just focus on something that's unambiguous, which is reducing military spending? Put that money into daycare, put that money into, you know, fighting the climate crisis. Why would we get involved? And even if you believe that the, 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 the global South viewed the UN as somewhat as a counterweight to American dominance, why would we make that argument that's at, at minimum, at minimum an ambig ambiguous argument? Why wouldn't we just argue for the things that are-, that are Eve, you're at two, Eve, you're at two minutes. So Thank you. I, you can just, you can sum up. Yep, okay, thank you. All right, so, um, okay, so very lively uh, back and forth there. Thank you to our, our panelists. Um, know that that, uh, that was not necessarily easy. Um, and so I thank you for, for your passion and for, um, for communicating. And also, um, I see that there are panelists are still communicating in the chat. So please do uh, make sure to, to check there as well. So for the first poll that we did, um, I'm just gonna share the results with you. Clearly people have been reading Mitchell's article. Um, so at the beginning of the event, uh, Canadian peacekeeping has been a benign alternative to war and an alternative to NATO. 14% um, of you uh, voted uh, for that category. Uh, Canadian peacekeeping has primarily been a uh, means to advance Washington's objectives. 56% of you voted for that one. Not sure. There were 23% of you that voted for that. And neither or neither, 8% of you uh, voted for that. So I'm going to launch the uh, second poll um, to see whether uh, folks have changed their positions at all. So please do fill that out as well. And thanks to, to most of you for having filled that out. So we're now going to be moving to the Q&A portion of, uh, of the evening. And um, uh, we're actually gonna, the first question, we're gonna stay on Haiti. Um, and so the first question is, is directed at Walter. Um, so I wanna ask you directly and you know, full disclosure, I was involved with um, Haiti solidarity activism, you know, just, on the whole, do you believe that the UN mission there in Haiti was a good thing? This, uh, this question is for Walter. Yes, I do. Um, and I'm sorry that Jamina uh, finds that offensive. Um, I visited Haiti on two occasions. Um, I lost members in the earthquake and I feel, felt a huge amount of um, empathy for the Haitian people and I wish I could, could have done more. I was proud that Canada sent ships to help with the rescue after the earthquake in 2010. And I saw a lot of dedicated soldiers, including from CARICOM nations and from all around the world, trying to do their best to help the Haitian people. And I think that the 2006 operations, there was, in the case of Dredme Wilme, there was some, some wrong UN action. But in the case of the Boston um, slum and the gang warfare in Boston by Evans Jun that that was quite justified and it really caused Cité Soleil to be um, liberated. And as one man who ended up uh, losing a leg because of uh, the fighting that went on during that incident, he said, I may have lost my, my leg, but I'm grateful because now I have my freedom. 
All right, so I'll, I'll uh, allow um, some responses to that. Um, brief, and if there are any brief responses, um, you can just put your hand up as panelists and I'll call on you. What freedom has, hate, has, has the UN brought to Haiti? Hey, the UN has been there for 18 years. The UN has removed all, you know, the UN is behind the fact that we don't have elected officials. There's an acting prime minister. There's an assass assassination, a complete support for a right-wing president that was assassinated and a right-wing PM who's implicated in the, in, in the assassination. We can talk individually. We can talk about individuals. You can have as much empathy as you want for Haiti. The point, though, is this is a structural problem. This is global white supremacy. This is an unequal world order where white people in white countries can come in and make these decisions and then, then ruin countries and then come back and act as saviors. And we need to drop this idea that we need white, the white West as our saviors. The white West are the ones that cause our problem in Haiti. All Haitians have been asking for is to leave us alone. You guys refuse to leave us alone. We don't want the UN. We don't want the OAS. We don't want Helen Lalin. We don't want, we don't want the academics. And we don't want that because what at the core of Haiti's 200 and, 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 and so, you know, 18 year history is Western invasions and, 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 and interruptions and, 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 and un unsettling our country. We want people out. And so no matter how clean you want to make the UN and all these international organizations, we cannot because they were born in flames. They were born through co the colonization and the unequal ordering of the world. That's the reality. The reality is that the UN doesn't have troops in Haiti now. And after they the left, UN still has troops in Haiti. The increase. UN has the B new office, which was whose mandate was just renewed on July 15th after a lot of discussion and a lot of protests both in Haiti and the U.S. to not renew its mandate. It might not have a full military force, but the U.N. through the El Helen Lalim and the core group still run politics in Haiti. Let's be real about this. Let's be real about this. Thank you, panelists. I'm just going to ask just to make my job a little easier as the um, facilitator. If you just if you if you want to respond, if, if you know where it is, if you don't know where it is, just put your real hand up um, and I will call on you. But thank you. Thank you for those comments. Is there anyone else that wants to jump in on, on this particular question? If not, I'll move on. All right, so the next question that I have is uh, for critics uh, of peacekeeping. Are you arguing that peacekeeping has never been useful? So I'm gonna put that to, to the folks that have been cr uh, criticizing uh, peacekeeping. Maybe I'll start with Mitchell uh, and then Eve. And if anyone else wants to join in, uh, please do so. Um, well, I, I think refugee evacuation and election observations theoretically could be quite helpful. Um, you know, and, and the issue is in what forces it embedded in and, and who's doing it. Uh, ultimately, I do not think the Canadian military can be a force for peace. That's not what it's designed for. Um, that is by the admission of Rick Hillier that the Canadian military is a force to kill people. And uh, I do not believe that, 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 that you, you can salvage that. Um, and I, I would say that in cases where you know, Western interests have been compromised by, say, uh, you know, popular left-wing movements, which you know, could have emerged favorably from peacekeeping operations, those peacekeeping operations have been significantly compromised. If you look at the election observation mission in, in the West Sahara, for instance, around the independence referendum. That is a very famous case. Um, and I would say I sympathize with the independence movement there. They were initially seeking independence from Morocco and by extension, fascist Spain. But it took about 20 years <laughs> to get, you know, um, and uh, there was definitely meandering at, at the apparatus level. So um, I, uh, the point is I'm against sending the Canadian military abroad anywhere. Thank you, Mitchell. Eve, and then we'll have any responses to that. Well, I, I mean, I think, no, I think there are cases where the, the, there had been positive effects. Uh, I don't think like, again, like Berkison said, I don't think the Canadian military, the Canadian military has been, is, has been used as a, a force to, um, 
it's about it's about NATO. It's not about offering up the Canadian military the service of humankind, right? The the objective in Egypt in '56 was not to protect Egyptian sovereignty, not to protect Egyptian civilians. The outcome of the mission, at least in the short term, was actually a positive outcome, largely or you know, partly. Um, I, I've suggested that the Canada should announce that it won't send um, troops in UN missions unless it, it gets an approval from the General Assembly and to change the whole structure of the Security Council and, and how that the control of the, that power dynamic. Something that we should note that the Canadian government was a big proponent in the creation of UN, was a proponent of the uh, Security Council, even against Australia, which was with the... Uh, with the, uh, the smaller countries that were opposing this, the big five veto on the Security Council. Um, but so, yeah, I think that, I think that we you know, have to, we, the focus shouldn't be, uh, like I get back to that same question, of the, the focus for internationalist minded, uh, anti-racist minded Canadians should be the unambiguous foreign policy things or overwhelmingly unambiguous foreign policy measures that, that our military and our government are pursuing uh, that are negative and to, to combat those, not to you know, get involved in some debate about, you know, in some cases, the you know, dispatching of Canadian military may have some positive effect. Um, I think that that just, that type of thinking upholds militarism in this country. It upholds the idea of benevolent Canada. It upholds the idea of, of uh, the white man's burden. And, and I think that those are things that need to be, um, need to be uh, you know, challenged if we want a, a better world and, and a better Canadian foreign policy or a less bad Canadian foreign policy. And I just want to quickly say, and I see Walter's hands up. I just want to quickly say that as long as these, these institutions are linked to US and Western imperialism, they cannot work in support of human rights. As long as the, the, they're linked to the former colonizing countries, that we cannot um, work. We need a new multipolar world. We need a world where there's true democracy, where countries uh, and entities come together outside of the Western context, outside of this long history of Western control and Western imperialism. And until these are decoupled, until these organ institutions are truly global, I don't support any of the so-called Western-led peacekeeping troops. And that's the reality. Uh, just before I go to Walter, Jimmy, you mentioned in the chat that the um, that there is there is a lack of democracy at the United Nations. Would you care to comment on that briefly? No, I already said it. There's a Security Council that makes all the decisions. That their permanent seats, they've been the same five countries, well, uh, you know, the, the, at least the same four countries since 1945. How is this a democratic institution where you have five permanent members who can decide to veto, who decide what cases to take? And so that is not a democracy. That's having, that's like being in a cafeteria. You have the head table and you have the headmaster sit there and everybody else is subordinate. No matter what you say about all these countries, they're all subordinate to the Security Council, which, and then, and so it's not a democratic institution. And until it becomes, it cannot become one until, because it's so coupled with Western imperialism. And until it's decoupled, I think we need to actually dismantle it and some come up with something very different, something that allows the rest of us to be treated like human beings. Thank you, Jimima. Walter? Yeah, thanks. I can resonate a lot with the remarks of Eve and Jimima. Um, I think the P5 in the Security Council is an extremely undemocratic mechanism. It was born out of power politics after the Second World War, and it should be changed. We should abolish the veto. We should try and stop Russia and China from their gross abuse of the veto on, on all kinds of things, including most recently in Ukraine. Um, I point out that the General Assembly, where one each nation has one vote of the 193 members, it approves the budget every year of peacekeeping. The peacekeeping could not go ahead without the General Assembly. It's an important part of it. And the majority of peacekeepers, over 80% of them, come from the developing world, which are the majority, in fact, the two thirds majority of the members of the General Assembly. And finally, I, I hope that the, the notion of white man's burden is in the dustbin of history. I, I bristle at the thought of that. I find it really uh, objectionable. And um, I really don't want to be, be judged by the color of our skin or look at the world through the, world, the eyes of black versus white. I wanna look them through human eyes where we see all of us as human beings. 
and eventually create a worldwide democracy where every person can have a vote in how this world is governed. Okay, so the next question that we have um, is despite uh, is for proponents now of peacekeeping, can Canada be a neutral peacekeeping country when its military is so tied up with the US? So this has been addressed uh, a little bit, but Peter, we'll, we'll hear from you first. Well, uh, he was correct about the deep integration of the Canadian forces with the Union Americans. Uh, most don't know it, but we're also part of a North American defense industrial base. Uh, back in the mid 80s, uh, Canadian Forces officers actually went down to Washington to uh, ask them how they coordinated military industrial relations and they um, invited them back. So uh, uh, approximately 12, 14 uh, uh, military lobbies came from Washington and set up branch plants in Ottawa. Uh, can, uh, can the Canadian forces act uh, independently now of uh, the US? Um, I think the only place that they actually can act independently is in, within a UN peace operation. And uh, that's partially because the Americans don't have the control. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do favor still further participation of Canada in UN peacekeeping. I think that's rather important. I think we don't want to be seen as isolationist in a period of turmoil, especially with so many million refugees and climate change forcing so many people out of the equator zone. I think we've got an obligation to provide help and care. I'm not sure I want to argue for, and I, I don't support the increases in military spending or the current weapons acquisitions. Those aren't gonna help people. F-35s and surface combatant ships are going to be irrelevant. We won't have wars of that nature in 20 years when they're around. But could Canada actually take a lead role on something more ambitious toward developing a UN emergency peace service, not, of, not composed of those national military units, which is currently the case with UN peace operations, but drawing from recruited individuals worldwide. A lot of people your age, even, well, not my age, but a lot would want to serve humanity. And I, I would think that we give further thought toward that because it's about time that the UN had its own capacity rather than blaming all the national militaries and you know, drawing in Vietnam and Afghanistan and Korea, those weren't peace operations. Those weren't peacekeeping. So let's, let's at least be rigorous in terms of what is and what isn't peacekeeping. Uh, and let's say, you know, if there was a UN capacity, a standing capacity, a permanent capacity composed of devoted individuals under UN direction with, you know, a mandate to protect, to prevent armed conflict, to help people. I would be all in favor of that. I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mitchell? Uh, yes, just to, to come very briefly, um, I, I would maybe question slightly the the reason why can Canadian peacekeeping isn't independent, I think it has to do with more than just its reliance on the United States. I think actually Canada has its own interests, um, in particular its own imperial interests. There was actually an article in 1999 in the Globe written by the head of the Mining Association of Canada, which said it was absolutely unacceptable that peacekeepers have exited Africa, given how much Canadian mining companies had spent there. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about Haiti. I think also an important role is how Canadian businesses profited enormously off of the occupation of Haiti and the coup. Yeah, and that they have an interest in keeping resources cheap and labor cheap. And that's true. Uh, that is the overall goal of Canadian imperialism and that's the overall mandate 
of the Canadian military. And the fact is that they operate under the direction of, of Canadian officers. Throughout the 90s, we haven't talked about it, but one of the big causes of violence was that Canadian mining companies, Canadian businesses would ferment civil wars across Africa with sending guns and mercenaries in. And then the Canadian, peace, the Canadian Department of Defense would insist on sending in a peacekeeping force with a wide mandate to use violence, insisting that something had to be done. Well, perhaps Canadian business could leave these places alone. And the Canadian military could follow suit as well, um, would be my suggestion. Okay, Walter, um, very quickly, because we have two more questions and we're all, almost completely out of time. Yeah, very quickly. Um, the UN uses the term impartiality, not neutrality, because they actually care about what happens to the in the conflict and to the people there. Um, and I have seen people, Canadian officers in the field, who have very professionally made an oath to the UN not to take instructions from any other body except the UN. And uh, they dutifully carry that out. So I can say very confidently and affirmatively that yes, Canada can be a, an impartial peacekeeper. Uh, thank you, Walter. Uh, we actually have a few questions, but just again, very briefly that were directed towards you in the chat. Um, someone wants to know whether or not you believe Canada isn't an imperialist nation. And then there's another person asking, Walter, do you think uh, a concern about manipulation uh, of elections in other countries. So I don't know if you want to address either of those questions. Sure, very quickly. Um, th there is neo-imperialism going on in the world today and we have to guard against it. Um, and I, when I walk through the arch at the Royal Military College, I shudder thinking about what is on, the, on that arch. It says the memory, the glorious memory of the ex-cadets of the Royal Military College who gave their lives for the empire. So that was 1920, 21 when we were still believing in, in a British empire. And thank God we buried that notion officially and, and in, in other ways, we're not here to serve an empire, we're here to serve the cause of humanity. And yes, we can't be manipulated by power. The world is, is, a, is a struggle between idealism and realism, between those who, who want to do what's right and those who are forced to do what, uh, what the more powerful say. And I think that we have to do everything we can to make sure that idealism succeeds and peacekeeping is a key forum for that form, for that expression of idealism. Thank you, Walter. Um, I have a question for Peter. Some argue that peacekeeping is conflated with other UN missions. Uh, can you can you elaborate on this or answer this? And again, as briefly as possible. That peacekeeping is conflated with other UN missions. Yeah, UN missions that are not necessarily peacekeeping. Well. You know, there is a distinction between peace enforcement, which is much more aligned with war fighting. And uh, in peace enforcement, uh, as in war, almost anything goes, but that's not the case at all in peacekeeping. You have very strict limits over the use of force, over rules of engagement, uh, standard operating procedures. You know, I think you can only use force in peacekeeping now in self-defense and defense of the mission or in extreme cases where there may be a need to go on a tactical offensive if countering belligerent, belligerents and spoilers who are actually already causing harm and violence. Uh, but that's very rare now. It is the exception. So. Uh, it's important, it's really important not to ascribe blame that goes toward wars toward those who are trying to keep the peace. That's just unfair. People give their lives to try to make the world a little bit better and to save others and to blame them for war and wars that they weren't involved in and to blame the UN for wars that really had nothing to do with peacekeeping. That's, that's just, it's, it's intellectually dishonest and it's unfair. So the next, uh, the last question that we have here is, um, uh, despite its reputation as a peacekeeping nation, Canada doesn't actually even have many peacekeepers on the ground. Um, can you comment on this direction? Is there anyone who care to comment on that? Walter? Uh, yes, um, Canada for 40 years had a thousand peacekeepers deployed and uh, we could be, the UN could rely on us very uh, confidently during crises that we would provide peacekeepers. 
But uh, Canada for 20 years has been saying no to the UN and surprise the UN keeps asking. Uh, currently, we, we have just the 30 military and approximately the same number of police uh, deployed on missions all around the world. And that is, you take the whole world. So 60 people uh, can fit on a school bus. Um, and it's hardly uh, behooves a country like Canada to contribute so little when there's so much need in the world today. Thank you, Walter. So um, I'm going to allow the panelists to uh, give concluding statements of about a minute if uh, they so choose. It's optional. Um, and but before that, I'm just going to let you all know the results of the poll. So for the initial poll, like I said, is Can has Canadian peacekeeping been a benign alternative to war and an alternative to NATO? Uh, initial results were at 13% before our uh, debate, um, and it is now at 8%. Um, has Canadian uh, peacekeeping primarily been an, a means to advance Washington's objectives? At the beginning of the discussion, 56% of the audience voted yes. Um, and at the end of our discussion, we now have 70% of our audience uh, who believe that it has uh, primarily been a means to advance Washington's objectives. Uh, initially, not sure was 23%, it's now 8%. And uh, both, neither was initially at 8% uh, and it's now at 15%. So thank you, thank you to the audience for participating in that. Um, and uh, uh, would any of the panelists like to give uh, concluding statements before uh, we, we leave for the evening? Just a word of thanks to everyone for a really uh, good, useful discussion. I'd love to go more into the historical details. I see some historians among my fellow panelists and I'd be happy to continue this conversation at other points. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, anyone else? I'd like uh, to... Um, I'd like to say, I'd like to respond to Peter to say calling it a blame game, pointing out historical realities and material realities on the ground is not a blame game that that's without um, that, that's that's without any recourse. It's not even about like being intellectually dishonest when I'm laying out very clear, real realities on the ground. And so and then to so to talk about colonialism, to talk about slavery is not to have a blame game is to explain and understand why it is that we are where we are today. And the only thing I want to say when we end is this is not about individuals. You know, when I teach my students in, in international development, you have all these Western kids who want to go to Africa and help and I'm like, it's nice and all, but there's a structural relationship in the world where there's this idea that the West needs to go somewhere else to help these poor people without them realizing that it is the way that the, the, the way that colonialism and imperialism has actually structured the world so that these you know, these developing countries are underdeveloped. And so for me, I always focus on the structural issues. The UN is a problem because it's, a, it's tied directly to the long history of imperialism. And until we remove this personal thing and really focus on the structures of power, we cannot have a, a, an honest analysis or even a, per, a, a correct correct historical one. And so I, I'd like to end there. And, 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 I, and I hope you all leave and think, you know, let's listen to more of these Haitian voices that have been protesting and wanting the, the, these so-called peacekeepers, these violent peacekeepers who have been really uh, terrible to the people. I hope, you know, you support their call to remove the UN out of Haiti. Thank you. Thank you, Jimima, and thank you to our panelists for taking part in this debate. It's been great to be a part of it. Thank you for your Thank you for the bold discussion. Um, it has been a good exchange. Uh, again, thank you to Eve. Uh, thank you to Jamima. Thank you to Walter. Thank you to Mitchell. Um, thank you to Peter. Um, and thank you to the audience for uh, participating in our poll and to those of you who submitted your questions. So that's it for our event tonight. If you liked events like these, please do consider making a donation to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. Once again, thank you to our excellent speakers. Thank you to the audience for joining us. That's it for our program. Good night and peace. Thank you. Well done.